someone took me there and we bought materials and I found this paper. And uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but the, uh, they only had 20 pieces of this paper. And so I was reading the, the New York Times and one of the, air, one of the housekeepers at the guest house uh, comes to tune in my train and he passed the newspaper stand every morning and one morning he brought me the New York Times because he thought that it would be of interest and um, I was so surprised to come to breakfast and have the newspaper there so then I began to read the paper of course I was getting information online but uh, I started to read the physical paper and then there was so much information to absorb in the beginning, you know. Uh, even now there still is so much information, but in the beginning, uh, we didn't know what was happening or who or how or when. And um, I needed to read as much as I could to understand what was going on. So uh, I was grateful to have the newspapers. And then I started cutting out the articles and pasting them on the wall of the studio. And I had a uh, maybe six or seven meters in the wall. And um, then I started moving the articles around and trying to group them together by theme. And at the same time, I had this paper, and I didn't know what to do with the paper. I just had to wait. And then finally, I decided I have to do something that's related to this material. And, um, and then there were 20 pieces of paper, and they had no more. So I, had, I realized COVID-19 I must do, and I have the option of, of destroying one page, and that's it, I can't find any more. So then I started to work on the papers, and I had never worked with these things before. So a lot of it was experimenting and you know, trying to understand. So I decided that the circle is the basic form of containment that we understand as humans. You know, wells are round, uh, protected gardens are round, castle moats are, you know, in general, uh, a circle is a, protect, is a containment. And so I decided to make only circles. And this also goes back to my background in Japan to use circles. And uh, of course, influenced by the Blue Tide movement. Um, but, um, and also as a kind of interesting aside, my brothers play uh, right road bicycles with. The son of the founder of the time. But when I was a child, we didn't know what that was. It was only later that I found out. That was an interesting, interesting thing. So I just kept working. And the, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. It was very messy. And outside the studio was an open faucet for water for the garden. So I was always going in and out and out putting ink on and then washing it off, putting it on and washing it off. And then slowly, the drawings finished themselves. And sometimes they were ugly, and sometimes they were beautiful, and, but I was waiting till it had set and finished, and then I stopped. And then I, um, I still had all of these on the wall. And then after a while, I realized that some of the drawings have something maybe to do with that idea. And then I realized I have to put the articles on the back of the drawing so that the concept and the theme goes with this drawing. Um, it's not an interpretation, it's not a representation, it's not a figuration, it's not even metaphor, it's just a feeling of intuition that this text and this idea goes with this circle. So I think it's fine for people to project a different one on a different circle too. It doesn't, uh, it's not fixed. What are the colors? I think uh, traditionally in Western society, the black color would indicate death or heaviness. But in Japanese society, it's just form. And I, I think that I went back and forth between these two things, but I never really, uh, like there's one, one piece about the people who are dying of starving.
starvation or coronavirus or racial violence. Um, and I gave that one black ink. Um, or afterwards I saw it and I thought, well, this is a good match with that concept. But the one about death is yellow, so it's not, you know, it's more uplifting and enlightening and releasing. So I don't, uh, I mean, I study humanism and then I know the different psychological assignments to college, but I lived in so many different cultures that I don't really accept one color means one entity. Some are obviously softer. You know, and yes, this paper is very, very soft. But I don't, you know, so maybe it's more tender than a black one, but, uh, you know. What part has the written text in the book? I felt that uh, the direct reporting from the North newspaper is very helpful. But I also felt that there needed to be some kind of poetic response to the theme as well. And uh, so I chose some specific poet pieces of poetry that I think um, sometimes it's a big jump to go from the text in the newspaper to the poem that I chose. But I think there's an affinity um, which is important. At what time did you start making your so called life uh, transmission drawings? Beginning, the first one that I did was I was eating in a Chinese restaurant in San Francisco, and the chef was preparing. Uh, it was just a counter, and the kitchen was right in front of me. And the chef was cooking in a wok, and he had two instruments. And uh, I was just watching him, and I, I had my paper and pencils with me, and I asked if they would give me a clean bowl. And so then I made a circle of the bowl, which stood for the wok. And then I just tracked his hand movements um, as he was working. And um, those are, that's the first time that I drew with both hands. But then um, um, I didn't do it again. I did it intensely for maybe six months, and then I didn't do it again. But um, I, I practiced Aikido, a Japanese martial art, for 20 years. And when you do that slowly, your body becomes more symmetrical. And so, Sometimes when I was drawing with just my right hand, it felt strange, and so then I started drawing with both hands. And then more and more, uh, I got interested in the movement and activity of humans, you know, in different cultures and what we do with our time. And so then I started, it's something I always was fascinated with when I was a child, watching Japanese people do, working in the rice fields, or making a special kind of food in the kitchen or um, wearing clothes a certain way. It was always interesting. And so I started to um, track the movement. And since we do everything with two hands, it was logical to continue drawing with both hands. Uh, at the time, I didn't realize it was going to become a big series, but yeah, now it's like 4,000 drawings. And 25 years in five continents. It's a lot. The most successful of the drawings is when I am not thinking. I'm only tracking. I'm watching and it comes from there into my eyes and out my hands with not too much interference. You know, I have to sit up straight and see if the energy flows properly. Uh, it's, it's a very you know, meditative process, but I never decided that's the only way I can do it because it's challenging. I mean, people, uh, normally when you draw, you have an idea and you are transmitting something from your mind. In this case, I'm transmitting something with my eyes and hands. My mind helps me stay concentrated, but I'm trying not to evaluate what I'm doing or what the person is doing or what I'm thinking. So I pay attention to observing and I'm trying to be as, as accurate as possible. And uh, one time I wanted to know whether or not they really are accurate. And a friend of mine uh, who is a pianist, prof 
performed uh, the same composed piece using a score on the piano, and I made small, medium, and large, and it was music I didn't know, uh, and, I made, and the drawings are almost identical, so I realized that I am actually pretty accurate with it, so that's good, because I don't, you know, abstract expressionism has already been done, and I don't see that as my job. For William Burroughs, time is the resource. Mm -hmm. For the three times form. These ideas were expressed in a conversation that Leslie Lee animated on space and time recorded at the Nova Convention in 1978. What attitude have you to time and space? It's really hard to separate time and space. Um, I mean, you can't. Very aware of the passage of time, but I think also that's a I think it's conditioned by society. You know, we think that time is linear. You know, like if you take a deep breath and then you exhale, you know, there's a certain amount of measurable time that happens in that. How did you make to and how did you start? It was 1961. I was in college and I was going to uh, an Immaculate Heart College in Los Angeles. And they have uh, the buildings of the university are on the hill. So the philosophy department was on the top of the hill, the music department was next, and, and, and so forth down the hill. And, I like to explore old buildings. It was an old house. Uh, and so um, when I came down from the philosophy class, I found this room in the second building in the music department, um, which it was a small room. I think maybe it was eight meters square. And it had windows all across two sides of the room. And outside the window were redwood trees. And the redwood trees are very dark, but when the light comes down from the top, the, the bark turns red. And it's, it's a very beautiful room. And it was a peaceful room. And it was a room in which the musicians kept the instruments for the orchestra. But they were not in a kind of structured way. You know, the flute was lying on top of the piano, and the tuba was leaning against the piano, and you know, a little on the window sill. It was that kind of uh, that kind of situation, very casual. And I I liked to sit in this room and imagine the sound of these instruments. So I think this was the beginning of my uh, conceptual thinking because I don't play an instrument. Just enjoying the silence of the instruments. And so after my philosophy class, I always went in there and stayed for half an hour and then I continued. And um, one day I came in there and there was a rehearsal going on. There were six musicians, all with string instruments, and one conductor and two or three other people. And I had no idea what it was. And I was curious, and when I opened the door, nobody stopped me, so I just came in and I sat down and I watched and listened. And the thing that was very interesting was the man was conducting the musicians using his, you know, his arms as hands of a clock, and I had never seen that before. And uh, there was, uh, the thing that caught my attention was that the three of the musicians so excited and so happy to be doing this and very active. And the other ones were acting in a different way. They were really angry. And I couldn't understand why half of them could be happy and half of them could be angry. And at some point I got up and I walked over to look at the score. And then that was the first contemporary music that I had ever seen. And, you know, I, I saw that they, you know, there's lines going on and then there were multiple choices. Mm -hmm. And so it was clear that the musicians who were happy were the ones who were going to make a choice and see what happens. 
what was that and who was that? And then somebody told me it was John Cage. And then uh, I found the book, uh, The Year from Monday. <clears throat> and I started to read the book. And then I started following more um, contemporary music because it was curious to me. It wasn't like anything I had ever heard before. And uh, yeah, so, so by myself, I just was curious about it. And then later I met him, and then, you know, when I went to New York, uh, finally, I already had many years of listening to contemporary music, and I started to meet the composer, so it was pretty interesting. In 2016, you start thinking of your project handwriting the Constitution. Today, we have, we have more or less violent protests in the United States in the context of the movement Black Lives Matter after the murder of George Floyd. But what is the idea of the project and how do you realize it? Well, um, when Donald Trump was elected president of the United States, I was very upset because I don't think he's a good person to have in that position. Um, and we knew He didn't become president until January. There's always this period of transition from the between the election and the actual inauguration of the president. And during that time, um, it was difficult to absorb. It was frustrating. It made many people angry. It was like it didn't feel right and so forth. Um, and I was thinking, what can I do about it? Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I said, sure, I don't 
thinking a lot about these thoughts, you know, what's the meaning of life and what do you, you know, at some point we, our lives end and what will make it feel satisfying to just let go of having accomplished X, Y, and Z or whatever. And I've been thinking a lot about how do I value or evaluate my life. And this poem is a very good meditation on that. It's a beautiful idea. And the more you say it to yourself, the more you realize that we are a part of each other. It's, it makes the quality of life much better. I didn't know that as I was working on these things one by one, but now that I have such a body of work, and I, last year I had three retrospective exhibitions in New York in the springtime in three different galleries, so I could see this work, and I could see how the different series grew out of each other. Very satisfying to realize that it makes sense because sometimes the jump from one to the next is so radical that I don't even understand it. I, mean, I never worked with this ink before, I never did, you know, colored work like this. So uh, it was satisfying to see that, it's, that it all fits together. And this poem is, uh, it has some wonderful, wonderful sentences in it. And so I decided. I've been thinking about it for a long time and wondering, is this the next one that I will do with Vex? And I wanted to do it, but I had to find Monte. And so uh, I walked into the workshop of the editor, and he had this new letter that he had found, which was a big U. And I saw the letter on the wall, and I realized, we do it. There's, um, we made an edition of, I forget if it's 12 or 15, but there are five more that I'm going to draw on. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how. I, was, I imagine drawing, on sh drawing ships mm -hmm. because that's kind of the coming around. Again, also, this was on ships, but also my father was a sea captain and when we went to Japan, we went on ships, and now we're going to be in Venice with ships. And, you know, Maybe I just feel like drawing ships. I don't know. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's 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 about. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I think it's, in some ways it's self-explanatory, but it's also the the old letters. You know, they're hand carved letters. They're made out of wood. They're more than hundred years old. They have holes in them because the termites have eaten them. You know, and you know our bodies fall apart when we get older. I mean, it's all part of the same. Process of living by, and I find it very interesting. Um, also, concerning Venice, recently in Venice you realized you know, what gondolier you were thinking about. What is the idea or uh, the context about this book? Well, you know, in the gondolier is so uh, important, and it's, they're very important in Venice. And you, they're very visible, you know, and you don't see gondolier, uh, gondole coming like this anywhere else in the world. Like when you see a gondola, you know, it's Venice. Or if it's Disneyland, it's a cop, you know, it's whatever. And, uh, but Venezia is really so beautiful in the gondolier, it's so, you know, it's an organic part of it. But then I, it just occurred to me one day, why are there any women? I know that some of these old professions, you know, the men really cannot stand the idea of having a woman there. Um, bartender is one, you know, now who can serve the drinks, but they can't actually make the drinks. And, you know, it's changing slowly. But anyway, for those of us, I just thought, what's going on with this? So I asked, and one of the gondoliers I me there's one. And I one, how is it possible there's one? And it turns out her father was a gondolier, and uh, she inherited his contract because they have contracts. They can't, not everybody can do it, and you have to buy a contract. You know, it's a complicated thing. It's like a, a guild, an ancient guild, and uh, they didn't want any women. And so there is one German transvestite who went from woman to man, who is a gondolier. But um, George Bosco is the only woman who actually 
So I, I just thought this is, in the print shop they have these numbers that are gorgeous numbers and I thought what can we do with the numbers? And then I found out 433 and 1, that's the first thing we do with the numbers. I printed and framed one for her and I found out where she works and so I'm, I already met her and I told her that I have something for her. But then the coronavirus intervened with all of us and if she's still there, Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome to you and all you write.